Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Jia Xuan from Science Advisory Team, and I will be the moderator for today's session. Um, joining us today is our Head of Investment Advisory, Ritesh, who will be sharing with us his market outlook for quarter three. So um, feel free to post your questions in the Q&A box below, and we'll be taking some pauses along the way to address them. And uh, with so much happening in the markets nowadays, um, I'm sure there's a lot to talk about. And so without further ado, uh, let me now hand this over to you, Ritesh. Hey, Jajwin. Thanks for um, making the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, today, we are going to cover uh, the Q3 2021 market outlook by SAIF. So uh, let's first look at what is top on mind for investors around the world. So if you look at this particular slide, um, obviously, the US markets are pretty much at all-time highs. Uh, versus contrastingly, the China markets has crashed and amidst like regulatory pressures and all, um, there is like a divergence in terms of returns between these markets. Uh, of course, uh, del Delta variant of the coronavirus is also something that has been unnerving a lot of uh, people around the world and governments which had plans to reopen the economy um, are facing an uncertain time in terms of reopening and um, slowing growth expectations as well. On top of that, um, there has been a surge in inflation in the last couple of months. So that begs the question that if interest rates are going to increase, plus um, if you read the news yesterday, Fed came out and in the minutes it was shared that Fed might be looking to taper um, the bond buying program as early as September 2021. So which is again had a little bit of a jitter in the market uh, where last night the market closed down. So given this situation, obviously everyone wants to get a gauge as to what's the market outlook going forward, as well as what investment strategy should we follow. So let's look at the agenda for today. So we will first cover a quick market snapshot. We will look at uh, the economic path to recovery. Uh, then we will see how the market outlook shapes up going forward, as well as investment strategies that you could follow. And uh, we will wrap it up with an introduction to SAIF and a Q&A session thereafter. Now, let's quickly take a peek into the market snapshot. Uh, if you look at this chart, essentially what it tells you is that the S&P 500 has doubled on a closing basis from its COVID trough of uh, March 23, 2020, when it dropped to 2237.40. Now it is pretty much double that value. And it is worth noting that the market has only taken 354 trading days to get to this level, right? And this marks basically the fastest bull market doubling from the bottom since World War II. And um, just to, again, contrast it, even during financial crisis, the S&P 500 hit the bottom in March around 2009. 2009. And uh, the benchmark after that, even with the stimulus programs that ran during those times, uh, the benchmark did not double until two years out, which is like April 2011. So uh, on average, it takes bull markets more than 1,000 trading days, so more than three years to reach this kind of a milestone. So, so this does come as a huge surprise to a lot of skeptics as to how this thing has happened in such a short period of time. Uh, overall, the market gains have come so fast that if you look at even um, Wall Street expectations of where S&P should head end of 2021, uh, the present levels are actually already four to five percent above the Wall Street average expectations, which was, you know, the year end target was 4,330 on average uh, across top Wall Street strategies. So, you know, the market is much, much ahead uh, even beyond that. Now, obviously, the numbers may seem uh, too good to be true, um, but this powerful rally does have some fundamental support to it. Uh, it comes on the back of a massive earnings comeback. If you look at corporate profits on the left-hand side chart, they have jumped off the pandemic bottom. And S&P 500 companies have reported 53% year-on-year growth for the first quarter, and they're set to post more than 94% surge for the second quarter as well, right? So, and this is data from uh, Reuters definitive um, for you to refer. Now, obviously, the first half of the rally that we saw in 2020 was led by the technology sector, and much of the rebound uh, was driven by these stay-at-home uh, trends that were prevalent in the later half of 2020. 
So investors flocked to these tech shares and embraced like mega cap names like the FANG stocks and all. And to the extent that these sectors have grown massively around 120% from the bottom of the pandemic. However, the rally um, in the sector seems to have slowed down in 2021 and more beaten down value sectors and value names, which are more tied to the economic recovery and reopening have taken the bait and in a way sort of sprinted forward. So these cyclical names would be your materials, energy, financials, industrials, um, all of these sectors have doubled from their 2020 bottom as well. And that's all thanks to a strong comeback this year uh, due to growing optimism towards the reopening. Uh, as we shared earlier, this is in contrast, the Chinese markets are sharply down, right? So while the global markets are hitting all time highs, the China market seems to be going down. And it's a hot topic at the moment because there have been some very sharp falls and the underperformance is across multiple Chinese stocks over the last few months. Now, what is really happening in China? China is actually facing a substantial regulatory crackdown in the internet sector, as well as some related sectors with government actions basically demonstrating that there is a determination to safeguard data security as well as sort of root out monopolistic practices. So there have been a slew of regulatory actions to that regard, uh, mostly focused on technology companies. If you look back, there was the Ant Group's IPO that was foiled, uh, cybersecurity reviews into ride-hailing uh, operator Didi. Um, all of these has basically led to the Chinese stock market to be amongst the world's top laggards for the year. Uh, to the extent that if you look at this chart, MSCI China is down 12.2% for the year and MSCI China for um, the technology sector is down even more at 19% year to date. Uh, in contrast, the S&P 500 and MSCI world, as we spoke earlier, is up more than 15% for the whole year. If you look at this data a little bit longer term as well, so if you look at the next slide, um, what you will observe is the correction is even more stark um, when, when you look at the long-term trend. The MSCI world, which is the blue line, um, which tends to lag uh, compared to the, these, these uh, more high growth sectors uh, is at all time highs, right? And it's 60% up compared to what it was two and a half years ago. But China is actually back at pre-COVID levels and back at like 2019 levels. And uh, these are times where, you know, pre-COVID when unprecedented level of its fiscal and monetary stimulus programs started hitting the global financial economies and markets. And that led to the huge rally that we have seen so far. So it is really um, hard to you know, see that most of the Chinese companies and the broader Chinese market is back at pre-COVID levels. And if you look at the more highlighted names that are being put in here, um, so Alibaba, for example, Tencent, which is the yellow line, they have all given back all their gains post-COVID and they're actually down close to 40% from their peak levels. Now, so obviously the bigger question that investors mind, um, you know, has is whether these regulatory actions would lead to a permanent impairment in the Chinese stock market valuation, or is there an end in sight when we can see them bouncing back, right? So we'll cover some of this later on as well as to how we think about China uh, going forward. But um, this is an important juncture and uh, uh, every day there are new regulatory actions coming in. Uh, no one knows which part of the market will be hit next. Uh, but this is obviously bringing in a lot of uncertainty um, investing into the Chinese markets. Now, let's look at the economic path to recovery. So overall, while the broader markets have continued to rally, um, there is basically expectation that there will be more volatility going forward and mutant returns down the road as well. Um, and the list of worries just keeps adding up. There is a spread of the Delta variant of coronavirus. There is slowing economic growth. And also Fed sort of giving indications that they are going to taper down on their bond purchases and the monetary policies will be tightened a bit as well. Um, on top of that, there hasn't been a meaningful correction in the stock market over the last one year or so. So if you look at each of these factors in a little bit more detail, um, let's look at the Delta variant case, right? The spread of the Delta variant um, of coronavirus has sort of derailed a lot of government's plans to return life to some sort of normalcy. Uh, as you can see on the chart on the left, 
the daily cases per million is rising again across the world and more particularly even in highly vaccinated countries such as the US and the UK, which is very alarming to see that, you know, these are countries where more than 60-70% of the population is vaccinated. Uh, even in Asia, there are fresh outbreaks and these have actually forced major cities in India, China, Australia, Philippines um, into, into lockdowns and uh, has sort of forced authorities to reinforce harsher restrictions. And this is especially required because most of these uh, uh, developing economies and emerging markets uh, do have lower vaccination rates. And that leaves people vulnerable to the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, sorry, the COVID-19, um, 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 sorry, the, <laughs> sorry, the COVID-19 virus. So uh, overall, uh, the Delta variant has um, also become the more dominant strain in many countries. So if you look at the next slide, you will observe that uh, uh, it now accounts for almost all cases, like 90 plus percent cases of COVID across say UK, US, Russia, Germany, and even in Singapore. And it is also proven to be the more patent, potent version of the virus per se compared to its predecessors. So, you know, if you look at the contagious level of um, the coronavirus, whereas, you know, previously it was one over 13, now it is one on 26. Um, so that's what the uh, virus is capable of. And it is capable to the extent that it is also infecting fully vaccinated people. And that is the bigger concern that if the virus is able to, you know, go through fully vaccinated people, does it pose risk to the broader population again? Uh, now, in terms of research, what has been found out is that vaccinated people still remain far less likely to um, those who have been not vaccinated at all to fall severely ill, right? Like, you know, to be required to put them in hospitalizations or to be dying from the coronavirus. So those cases remain very, very rare for fully vaccinated uh, people. And this is, you know, data that you can see on the right hand side uh, of this chart as well. And it basically gives us that glimmer of hope that uh, while the COVID virus might never fully go away, we will find ways to live with the virus in the new normal. Let's look at um, the broader fiscal stimulus uh, program uh, that has really helped us navigate through this pandemic in a much more effective manner. So um, as you all know, there has been an unprecedented amount of fiscal stimulus in response to the coronavirus. And if you look at the top left-hand side chart, uh, what it shows you is the enormity of the uh, fiscal stimulus package that has been put in place. So the COVID shock compared to the financial crisis shock is one fourth the impact, but it attracted four times the fiscal response uh, comparatively. And uh, this fiscal response adds up to more than 25% of US GDP. And if you look at the green, orange uh, bars as well, it, um, sort of indicates all the different relief acts that have been passed before, including the CARES Act, the COVID relief, and the more recent uh, 1.9 trillion uh, stimulus package that was passed in March as well, which was basically to give direct um, checks back to people so that they are able to uh, go about their livelihoods in a much better manner. Now, uh, last week on top of this, uh, we've seen the US Senate pass a $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill. So this is on the next slide if you um, uh, see that um, there is an attempt by the government to basically reverse decades of underinvestment in this area, right? This is um, most of the infrastructure that exists in the US has been not been touched for decades and decades. Um, it basically includes another $550 billion in new spending and areas such as road building, bridges, broadband, and even clean drinking water per se. Also on top of that, Democrats have actually put forward a plan to inject another $3.5 trillion budget proposal, and they intend to pass it later into the year to address gaps in more areas such as education, healthcare, and especially like climate initiatives. So these are again, very, very uh, big uh, initiatives that are planned going forward. And while these developments obviously um, do provide a boost to the growth uh, outlook going forward, there are also concerns about the huge financial deficit that uh, this whole thing brings onto the table and its long-term sort of implications, whether it is to inflation, whether it is to uh, taxation. And those are some of the things that is also making the markets again, a little bit jittery uh, going forward. 
Now, uh, let's look at inflation and uh, labor demand as well. These are also two of the things that are top on mind for a lot of investors. Um, the inflation data did start to go up, especially in the month of June when um, the inflation uh, numbers came out to be around 5.6%. So if you look at, uh, again, the graph on the uh, chart on the left, you will see that there is a big jump that has happened in June. Um, what has been observed for the July data, however, is that there is some tempering down of the inflation. So instead of going up, uh, the July data suggests that inflation numbers are becoming or peaking in a certain way uh, because the number came out to be 5.4% in July. And uh, that is compar compared to the last year, right? So year on year growth of 5.4%, which is still by itself and on an absolute number basis, pretty high. Uh, but uh, but in terms of um, if you look at the previous month's data, it is in line with June figures. Um, if you look at core inflation, which basically includes your energy and food, um, that number on a month to month basis increased by 0.3%. And that is, again, below the forecast of 0.4% um, that was put in um, as expected um, uh, growth for this uh, core inflation. And it is much, much below what happened in June when the core inflation rose month-on-month -month basis around 9.9%. Uh, similar to the overall CPI number, the core inflation number is also roughly around 4.3% uh, above the last year number, which is basically, again, decelerating from the 4.5% uh, uh, number that you saw in June. So overall looks like the inflation data is peaking, but too early to tell. Uh, on top of this, uh, most of the Federal Reserve um, officials and uh, Chairman Jeremy Powell himself have come out and said that most of these inflation pressures are transitory in nature and uh, they don't see prices to continue to increase for very, very long. So this is basically on the back of, you know, reopening of the economies, on the back of things coming off a lower base and things like that, right? So, and that's the reason why from an interest rate standpoint, they remain confident that they don't need to increase interest rate at least for 2023 uh, onwards. If you look at on the right hand side, there is um, uh, data about uh, the labor markets, right? And uh, what you see is again a very bright picture in terms of payrolls rising by 943k in July, much better than uh, the expected number, which was 845k, right? So overall, looks looks much much better. Um, you know, continues to give a very positive outlook as to how the labor market is shaping up, um, and. On top of this, there is also from an unemployment rate standpoint, the overall unemployment rate fell to 5.4%. And this was against an expected uh, unemployment rate of 5.7%. So again, um, looks like the economy is in a better shape. Uh, inflation concerns are seeming to be ebbing, as well as um, the, the labor markets continues to remain um, pretty steadfast. So overall, I mean, it does look like uh, the, the worst might be over, but again, this is just one month trend. So you cannot really put that as a thing that it will remain so going forward as well. So too early to tell, but you know, uh, we'll, we'll continue to monitor. If you uh, look at the more recent news, specifically yesterday from uh, the Federal Reserve, there were indications that they are going to close in on tapering. Uh, their bond purchase program. If you just look at the overall balance sheet of the Federal Reserve, it is again ballooned to eight trillion dollar plus over the last one year or so. And with inflation rising and labor markets improving, there are basically indications um, that came out from yesterday's Fed meeting minutes that it is going to taper its bond buying program as early as September this year. Now, again, um, it does not mean that the Fed will actually stop the bond buying pre program, it will just start to taper it. So right now, if the Fed is buying, say, $120 billion of securities every month, if it is to dial down, maybe you know, 10 to $15 billion worth of securities, um, it will dial down. So instead of 120, it will buy, say, 105 or something like that. So I, I don't think it is that big an issue. Um, obviously, the markets reacted in a negative way. The Dow Jones and S&P 500 was down more than 1% yesterday. And then even today, uh, pre-markets, the markets are down around 0.6%. The European markets are close to 2% down as well. So, so there is um, uh, a near-term sort of, um, 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 based on the news, a negative uh, uh, connotation to the market. But overall, I don't think the 
the effect should be that big per se. So, and and broadly, I think uh, the inflation concerns and all have also been there for the last two, three months. And the market seems to be ignoring that to a certain extent. And again, on the lines of, you know, considering that these are transitory and uh, Federal Reserve remaining uh, committed to interest rates hike much, much later into 2023, uh, the market is actually more concerned about economic growth, uh, specifically concerned about the Delta variants uh, rather than inflation per se, right? Like if the Delta variant has an effect on the reopening, that's a bigger concern for the market than just inflation and the tapering program and things like that, in my opinion. So uh, let's look uh, ahead and see what's the outlook going forward. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, this, these are projections from the IMF. The global economy is projected to grow at 6% per annum in 2021 and 4.9% for 2022. So this is um, in contrast to the previous update by IMF, uh, the numbers are a little higher, uh, close to 0.5% higher than the numbers that were projected earlier this year. And again, in terms of these growth forecasts, what it can also be observed is the growth forecast for more of the emerging markets and developing economies have actually been marked down. So the markup, the overall markup is actually driven more by the advanced economies. And uh, that's mainly because the advanced economies, especially and particularly the US, um, the fact that there are anticipated legislations to additional fiscal support and improved health metrics across the group, it um, basically reflects in the uh, higher growth prospects for the US and more developed markets per se. Now, obviously there are downside risks to these global uh, growth forecasts. And if I have to map them down into three main points, they will be number one, the slower than anticipated vaccine rollout, which could basically allow the virus to continue to mutate further and infect more people. Um, the second would be financial conditions could tighten, right? Like if inflation does run up, uh, that would be something that will be a surprise even to the Federal Reserve and the central banks, and they might need to take an action against it. Um, and thirdly, a potential sort of double hit to the more uh, emerging market economies, because there are worsening uh, pandemic dynamics there, and they do depend on external financial uh, help and things like that as well. So those um, uncertainties could severely affect their recovery and then can affect you know, in a trickle manner, the global growth as well. Now let's look at uh, individual markets as well. Uh, we talked about the US markets being at all time highs, uh, the China markets in contrast um, coming down quite substantially. So what, what does that imply on uh, the broader markets going forward? So uh, overall, the US market seems to be peaking. The equity market valuations in the US look a little bit stretched at 21 times forward P ratio, which if you compare to the historical average, it is actually more than one standard deviation above its historical average. So, you know, that does look um, like, you know, the US market is expensive. And this is, again, something that is top of mind on a lot of investors' mind that um, is there more room for the US markets to go or is there a crash coming soon? Right. Uh, however, I mean, if you compare equity markets in general to the fixed income market, the risk premium that you get from the equity markets basically remains in line with the historical, sorry, historical averages. So while there is a potential risk of rise in interest rates, um, I don't think it should challenge equity value valuations that significantly. Um, if you assume that the economies are going to, you know, um, get back up and running. That, I think, is a stronger indicator of how the equity markets behave rather than just uh, depending on the interest rates, which actually will have a, a bigger effect on the credit and the you know, uh, bond market space in general. So uh, um, broadly, we remain a little bit more pro-risk, um, even in the current situation, with uh, basically a preference to a more equity-tilted portfolio than, than a portfolio which is very, very heavily tilted towards fixed income. If you also look uh, within the um, equity markets, there has been a divergence and in terms of return metrics as well. So while bulk of the 2020 returns were driven by the growth sectors, um, the trend seems to be reversing and uh, the equity market rally seems to be broadening in general. So value sectors, again, 
sectors such as industrials, your financials, energy, all of these have been leading the 2021 rally as the economies reopen and um, you know the economic growth prospects improve as well. So, so this is a trend that I think can continue uh, as economies open up and uh, um, more of these cyclical sectors will stand to benefit um, with these uh, things playing out in the near term. So, so I mean, at the same time, I don't think um, uh, people should just come out of growth sector altogether. I think this is probably a right time to have a healthy mix of both the sectors because in general, from a more growth um, sector valuation standpoint, maybe they are peaked or they are pretty high. Um, but if you look at the more long-term context of these growth names, they have basically gotten entrenched in the, into our you know, daily lives. And um, the cash flows that these businesses are generating are very, very high. And what that means is they, are, they have very sustainable business models going into the future as well. So I won't totally discount the growth um, uh, sectors altogether, but it is not a bad idea to broaden your investment framework as well and have more value exposures built into your portfolios too. Now let's come back to China uh, a bit, right? So uh, we can see as like, you know, in this chart, again, there is a divergence, right? The global markets uh, basically represented through S&P 500 and MSCI world, uh, pretty much at all time highs, S&P 500, as we shared earlier, trading at forward P multiples of 21, so which is more than one standard deviation above its historical average. Uh, however, China is now trading at a significant discount um, compared to its pre-COVID levels, as well as you know very, very close to the levels that it was trading back in 2019. Um, despite overall having a very you know, strong and positive long-term growth outlook per se. So I think uh, Broadly, I, I believe that while the regulators have signaled uh, that there is potentially more pain to come, um, yet if you look at it from the China government and the China regulators' uh, viewpoint, their main focus seems to be reforms, right? They're trying to reform their economy and improve the domestic capital market uh, through higher levels of governance. So that is what they are trying to do. What that means is they are willing to go through short-term pain for long-term benefits for the overall population and for China in general as well. So what that means to us um, is that we do anticipate short-term disruption to the market sentiment and the pressures on valuations might remain, uh, especially on the offshore listed Chinese companies and in the related sectors like technology and all, uh, because the technology sector has particularly been affected uh, down more than 20% for the year. But uh, if you are a long-term investor, then I don't think there is a lot to worry about. Uh, this is a strategic, if you think of China as a strategic uh, allocation into your overall diversified portfolio, then I, I don't think this should change anything from a long-term positive growth outlook that remains there for the Chinese market, right? And, and more of the underlying digital plays and everything remaining there as well. So I, I don't think if you are investing into China from a long-term strategic standpoint, um, there is a need to panic. Uh, I would say remain invested. If um, uh, you're trying to time the market, I, I don't know when the bottom of the market will be, uh, but uh, but it's not a bad time to start accumul accumulating some of these names as they as they trend down per se. Uh, but more holistically, I think it is important to build a more diversified portfolio. A lot of people who have you know taken concentrated bets on China are burning right now, and these are similar things that have, we have learned um, you know historically over and over and over again that uh, if you put all your eggs in one basket and if something specific happens to that, that's where things can go really, really wrong. So do, do diversify your investments rather than just having it um, in, in one bucket. Uh, let's look at the next mega trend. So this is, I think, a very, very interesting slide. Um, green transition is something that has been talked about a fair bit of time, but I, I don't think there has been a very um, um, a serious attempt by investors and um, by the industry players to take this into consideration in terms of portfolio construction as well. Uh, and, and this basically, these are uh, charts from BlackRock and uh, the most recent report that I read from them uh, basically says that ignoring the effects of climate change on portfolios is not an option anymore, right? And, and the window for investors to position portfolios uh, with these things in mind is actually shrinking. Um, if you look at more on the long-term trends of 
sustainable investing in general, not just the green transition, but the overall ESG sustainability trend. There is a massive growth that you're observing um, in terms of uh, investors having interest in this area. And right now, I think it is growing steadily, but there will be a tipping point where I think uh, a lot of money flow will happen into these segments going forward. Um, to sort of drive home the point of clean energy of this green transition, it is important to, again, put some more context uh, out in the open. Um, so if you look at the US Senate, the recent $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill, part of it will go to climate initiatives. The $3.5 trillion that has been planned ahead as well, a lot of these will go into these green initiatives uh, as well. So if there is so much spending that is going to happen, of course, that will also impact um, your investments in these areas as they continue to grow. There is just a lot of uh, focus in the climate change and climate events around the world this year as well. And there's intensified debate because there was some report that came in, I think, just last week or so, where if um, the earth temperature moves by another 0.5% or so, that it will it will uh, it'll be not possible for us to reverse that trend going forward. So I think um, more drastic measures are going to come soon. And we as investors should also try and incorporate that into our portfolios. Uh, overall, uh, I, I think uh, markets, if you look from a return standpoint, because I think a lot of people do think that they do want to invest sustainably and they do want to make sure that they you know, are part of this green initiative, but does it translate into returns? And this is what I think the chart on the left depicts pretty, uh, pretty, um, uh, pretty well, where it shows that, that if you um, don't take the climate transition into effect technology and the energy sectors could be as high as 7% on an annualized basis. So that is the kind of stark difference in terms of returns that can happen if you if you don't take these things into account and and while there are a lot of trends which are just uh, you know passive and transitory as well i think this is one particular trend that i'm particularly um, um uh, i particularly think that it will have a more meaningful impact and effect going forward so important thing for everyone else to consider. all right one second uh, Jashwin, any questions, by the way, till this point of time? Yeah, so there are some questions um, flowing in, so maybe we can take some of them first. Yes. So um, the first one that we have over here, a viewer is actually, you know, um, asking with regards um, to the Chinese stocks that have been written down, right? So um, despite, you know, uh, more regulatory interventions uh, possibly coming along the way, right? Are there mm -hmm. any plans to really capitalize on this opportunity to include them uh, more in our next rebalancing, for, especially for our equity portfolios? Right. So I think, um, see, um, we have taken a very strategic approach in terms of uh, building our portfolios from ground up. And what that means is um, uh, China is part of that allocation structure more from a um, long-term investor framework per se. China is the second biggest economy in the world, so it should have a fair representation in your portfolio. Um, and the long-term growth aspects of it remain so as well. If you look at our portfolios um, from the core defensive, which is the um, more conservative portfolio, all the way to equity 100, which is a pure equity portfolio, the exposure to China roughly ranges from around 2-3% all the way to around 14% for equity 100. So uh, I, I believe that we are already having that necessary China exposure. And while that um, might impact a little negatively uh, to the current investors who are already invested into these uh, uh, portfolios with us, but because it's still a very, you know, like uh, overall a smaller portion of their allocation, it does not significantly impact the overall returns that the portfolios are generating, right? Uh, but at the same time, once the recovery happens and if investors continue to sort of DCA into their portfolios, uh, I think it will actually benefit them in the long term as they accumulate more units at current uh, lower prices. So, so uh, I believe uh, the allocation uh, that we have right now, um, while there is possibility that some changes might happen and in the, in the next rebalance, which is due to happen in October. But I don't see a significant change happening um, um, as, as we speak. Right. 
So separate from the equity 100 portfolio, uh, because we do recognize that, you know, China is the second largest economy right there. So um, do you actually, you know, have any thoughts in terms of like, you know, how much allocation should an individual investor have, you know, set aside to Chinese equities? <laughs> that's a that's a tough question. So usually each investor uh, will have their own uh, views and uh, um, uh, ways to sort of uh, design their portfolios. Um, generally, I, I don't think there is a right answer. Um, the general answer that I would want to say is that remain diversified. Um, if you want that Chinese exposure, uh, do have it, but do, don't uh, build it in... Um, uh, in a way such that if you have just a concentrated exposure just to the Chinese market and a significant, you know, sort of idiosyncratic event like what is happening right now happens to you, uh, it derails you from your long-term plans. That's what I think I'm most concerned about. So as long as it is part of your overall allocation, uh, I don't think um, you should be worried about. But um, uh, if, you, if you have to take a number, I, I think our equity 100 allocation is just perfect. Uh, I like that fact that it has got that 15 odd percent, 14 odd percent exposure to China. And and uh, if I were to design my own portfolio, I would definitely have a similar allocation as well. Hmm. Yeah, that's nice to know. Okay, so uh, moving away from the uh, US and China, so um, to Singapore itself, right? So um, where do you actually think, you know, the Singapore markets would be um, in the next 12 months? Right. Uh, I think, see, uh, the Singapore markets actually uh, have had a pretty decent rally um, into 2021. Uh, also, I think uh, if you look at the vaccination rates in Singapore right now, we are close to, I mean, almost reaching 80% vaccination rate, which is actually the highest in the world. And what that means is um, while there was you know, another phase two lockdown that happened um, last couple of months, uh, everything has started to open back again. And I'm fairly confident that uh, um, now going forward, if you, if you are uh, based in Singapore and if you're investing into the domestic market, at least from an economic growth standpoint, things look much, much brighter. Whether that translates into stock market returns is you know, hard to say. Uh, but if you look at some individual sectors like REITs and all, I'm fairly bullish because with the reopening, a lot of these malls and retail shop fronts and all, which were heavily, heavily impacted, are uh, again, you know, breathing, um, um, breathing well right now. You know, they've, they've gotten that breathing space and uh, we are seeing all the places, again, the footfalls and all are increasing as well. So on top of that, if our borders open up too, uh, that I think could have a significant impact uh, on these you know, uh, segments, more of the cyclical ones, I would say, uh, to, to continue that upward trajectory that we have been observing um, through the first half of 2021 as well. Right. Okay, so uh, moving away from like a geographical kind of diversification, let's talk about, you know, asset classes. Um, any thoughts, you know, with regards to investing into commodities, right, like such as gold, for example? Right. So, um, see, uh, I think the overall, uh, there has been, gold has traditionally been used as an inflation hedge, right? And uh, we do have gold in our portfolios as well uh, to specifically uh, give you that uncorrelated returns um, when the markets are uncertain, right? So it acts as a safe haven, it acts as a inflation hedge and things like that. Now, um, obviously the gold returns uh, um, more in the last say six months or so uh, haven't been that great. Um, and that is again on the back of the markets um, uh, having a one-way upward trajectory. Uh, going forward, though, I think in the long term, I see gold as a part of your overall allocation where you should have that 5-odd percent, 10 odd percent uh, allocation. Depending on your risk appetite, I think it's not a bad idea to have that exposure built in. Um, because... Uh, these, these exposures and uh, this particular um, uh, benefit that you're getting will not materialize in a very, very short term when uh, equity markets are rallying or um, generally the overall um, um, metrics don't seem to favor gold per se. Uh, but it is times when things are uncertain and there are events that are beyond our control. That's when I think these asset classes shine and um, those, are the, those are the purposes why gold and all figure in your portfolios in the long term, right? So, so I think um, uh, generally, 
I would remain uh, a little bit of an allocation of gold will remain in my portfolio uh, as a long-term investor. Whether I would have a more concentrated uh, exposure to gold, I don't think so. I don't see it as a return contributor. I see it more as a you know hedge uh, into my portfolio. Sure, sure. Actually, in fact, many clients are looking at uh, cryptocurrencies, right, as another hedge, <laughs> another like you know new gold per se. So, like you know, any thoughts on that? Uh, it's it's interesting actually. You see, um, uh, obviously, the acceptance of cryptocurrencies have um, improved a lot compared to the state that they were in. You know, say a few years back, there is more institutional uh, acceptance as well that we have been seeing. Uh, there are corporates who are buying into crypto as well. So there are positive trends. There are ETFs. There are funds that are getting listed, uh, having you know these cryptocurrencies as underliers. So there are definitely positive trends, but overall, they still remain a very, very volatile asset class, right? If you just see the last few months, the um, um, Bitcoin, I think, rose up to $60,000, $70,000. And then all of a sudden, there was like a 50% plus crash uh, coming in um, in June and July. So I am not sure if it will really act as an inflation hedge in the long term or not. Uh, there is that argument that it has limited supplies similar to gold, which should act as that, um, you know, safe haven asset and all as well. Uh, but it, that I think, in my opinion, only time will tell what I can say and see for now is that there is growing acceptance of uh, cryptocurrencies in the, in the broader market and even from an institutional side. Um, in terms of allocation, again, I would advise folks to put, put only their, say, casino money into it. So, you know, money that you're ready to lose altogether. Um, that's the kind of money that I will commit to crypto right now. Yeah. So we talk a lot about um, diversification, right? So like in fact, in this slide also, you mentioned that it's the only free lunch left. Um, would there be a situation whereby, you know, um, too much diversification actually increased risk? That's an interesting question. Um, I have to think about it. See, um, I think what you should not be doing is adding diversification for the sake of diversification. Right? Uh, diversification should actually translate into the overall you know, reduction of risk in your portfolio. That's the intent of why you should be doing diversification. Um, and to that extent, yes, I would agree that over diversification potentially might not really help um, in terms of you know, getting better risk adjusted returns per se. But uh, if you combine asset classes which are uncorrelated or inversely correlated and things like that, um, it does have a positive impact on your overall portfolio risk return paradigm. So whenever you are considering diversification metrics, do take into consideration what is your current portfolio mix? What are the asset classes that are there? What kind of you know, geographical exposures you have? What sector exposures you have? Uh, find out the correlation uh, with your existing portfolio to the new additions that you're considering. And then make that call whether it makes sense for you to add that new bit to your allocation, because um, if it is just for uh, additional return, uh, but it is highly correlated, uh, it, it might impact negatively rather than positively. Oh, sure. Okay, maybe let's take in um, one more question before we move on to the next section. Uh. So sure. uh, we do realize that uh, with regards to our current um, China allocation, Okay, uh, we have the MSCI China ETF as well as the uh, Chinese internet. Um, not so much allocation on into like the China A shares, right? So um, any thoughts on this um, uh, sector, whether or not, you know, we plan to adjust that as part of our Chinese, um, China allocation moving forward? Right, uh, I think that's a good question. Uh, I believe our, uh, the broader um, allocation that we have, the MCHI uh, ETF, it does have some A share, exposure as well. It is actually the broader China market um, um, uh, coverage that it brings onto the table. Mm -hmm. Whether having the specific uh, China A share or the local you know, market exposure is something that we should consider, um, maybe. Uh, we are considering certain different ways for you to get that exposure. So please do you know, keep a look out. Um, in, the, in the near future, we will find ways for you to have a little bit better control in terms of investments within SIF and there will be possibilities for you to get those exposures uh, from us uh, in the coming time. So, so do keep a lookout. Yeah, sure. So um, I think we can uh, take a pause on the Q&A. We can continue on with the next part of the presentation.
Great. So I think like these are uh, more of um, you know summarization slides where it is very important to highlight that um, diversification might not yield you the best returns. So if you look at small cap stocks, if you invest into it on a very long term basis, you will potentially have the highest returns in the long term. The point to note is the standard deviation or the volatility or the risk that you're taking with that is significantly high. And what that means is, would you survive a huge correction when these kind of investments take a severe beating? Similarly, if you take a specific China exposure risk and the whole China market comes down 30, 40%, um, would you panic or panic and sell? So instead of doing that, if you take a more broader approach and have a more diversified portfolio, and this is the point that I was trying to mention earlier as well, right? Like, you know, if you're reducing the overall risk of the portfolio, if the diversification actually helps you achieve that without um, really sacrificing too much of the return, uh, that's what I think the benefit of diversification is, right? Like you remove all your idiosyncratic risks and this is basically free, right? Like you just need to make sure that you diversify and, and you will get this particular aspect built in for you. And if you look at the performance of a diversified portfolio, it is pretty much at the higher end uh, compared to a lot of single um, exposure portfolios that you can build with, say, fixed income or other uh, such things as well. So overall, you're getting a much decent annualized return at half or even lesser the amount of risk that you're taking. So that's really the point of having a strong foundation so whether you want some specific exposures or not should come secondary first. The idea is build a solid foundation through a globally diversified portfolio. Once you have that, then you should take the next step of you know, having those multi-bagger options that you want to take uh, separately. So if we go on to the next slide, I think um, it's very important for people to realize that um, we get... Uh, you know, swayed a lot by these shiny objects. There have been cases where a lot of these mem stocks and all have rallied like 2x, 3x within a matter of days. What people don't realize is they follow the trend and they invest and suddenly the whole thing comes crashing down. And what that means is while a 20%, 25% positive return is great, but a negative 20%, a negative 30% is really hard to recover because if you lose, for example, 30%, if you want to go back to even, you need 43% recovery. If you lose 50%, your $100 becomes $50, you need 100% return to go back to even. So uh, again, the point that I'm trying to make is if you don't have a diversified portfolio, if you don't take care of your downside risks, um, this can lead to significant uh, negative uh, connotations to your investments uh, as well. So. Uh, be responsible when you are investing. Don't get swayed, even if there are certain things that look like um, you know the future, and those are the things that will give you multi-bagger returns. Um, I would advise that take small bets into them rather than as satellite portfolios or things like that per se. But have a more uh, well-balanced portfolio as a foundational aspect before venturing into those. So, and again, I think this is something that we espouse time and again. It is really about staying invested in the market, not trying to time the market. Um, this chart is very powerful because it tries, it, it depicts that if you are timing the market and if you lose 40 best days of the market upturn, you can actually lose money. Even in a 15 year time horizon, you can end up with less money than what you began. Versus if you just remained invested and didn't take any action, um, you can end up 3x, 4x times the money that you started off with, right? So it's very, very important that if you are investing to really grow your wealth, you should remain invested. Don't panic. Don't react to short-term market corrections. Accumulate when the markets are correcting. DCA into your portfolios rather than taking money out, right? So that has been the most, uh, I think, um, 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 promised way of generating returns in the long term. If you remain invested, I think there is history that if you remained invested into the equity markets for a 20 year time period, and if you go back 150 years, and if you remain invested like that, there has been no 20 year period where you have lost money, right? So that is a very, very powerful message um, to, to everyone that if you're investing for the long term and um, you don't react to short term corrections and all, um, you will, there, there is very, very high probability that you'll actually return uh, positive. Right, so so uh, time in the markets is much more important than time in the markets. So let's quickly wrap it up. So what we have learned today is basically 
Uh, number one, as you all know, equity markets are at all time highs. Um, most of the sectors are gaining, but uh, now it looks like the rally is broadening with value stocks starting to outperform. Uh, on the other side, in contrast, the China markets have crashed and now they're trading at pre-COVID levels, uh, mostly because of the regulatory crackdown that we have seen so far. The biggest concern that people have around economic growth is the Delta variant. And this has sort of disrupted the world's reopening plans to a certain extent um, right now. Uh, but if you look at more from a fiscal stimulus uh, and monetary stimulus standpoint, uh, there is still a, an unprecedented level of fiscal stimulus uh, in the economy. And there is continued easy monetary policy, uh, which sort of sets a solid foundation for us to see this rebound take shape uh, and continue going forward as well. And then while there is Fed taper talks um, amidst higher inflation expectations and rising labor demand, um, as I shared earlier, the current um, meeting minutes that have been shared, it looks like the Fed might start to taper in September 2021. Now, what will determine whether this is, uh, this is going to really affect the markets in a very um, uh, drastic manner is the pace of the taper rather than you know, just the news itself that they're going to taper out. So, so right now, my belief is that it will be small to begin with. So um, broadly, you can overall see that while the US markets and equity market valuations do remain stretched, but if you compare it against the uh, credit market and the bond market from a risk premium standpoint, the equity market still remains uh, much, much more attractive overall. Um, and on top of that, if you look at China, it is trading at a significant discount. Um, it's not a bad idea to start accumulating. If you have a broad based portfolio, which has China exposure, continue to DCA into that. Uh, but at the same time, don't put all your eggs into one basket. Don't you know treat it as a trading opportunity. Um, uh, uh, I think longer term, the China story remains intact. But given the regulatory uncertainty, um, the thing can persist, and we don't know how long it can persist. So you need to be super patient um, if you're investing into China going forward. Uh, on top of that, I think um, the green transition uh, thing is really something that cannot be ignored, and climate change aspects have been built into a lot of. Um, the plans that have been put in forth from a fiscal stimulus standpoint. So uh, from an investor's uh, interest area as well, this is something that cannot be ignored in invested portfolios going forward. So something that every one of us should note and maybe incorporate into our portfolios going forward. Um, last but not the least, uh, there are risks to the downside. So the only way to navigate through these uncertain periods is to have a more diversified portfolio and remaining invested. All right, so um, before we go on to the next section, so that's the uh, introduction to Saif. Uh, any any uh, couple more questions to take, Joshua? And I think we are already close to eight, so maybe I should uh, first cover it. All right, so if we move on to the next slide and the next one. So um, as you all know, so Saif is a digital wealth manager. We are headquartered in Singapore. Uh, we have a CMS fund management license. Our endeavor is really to democratize investments and make it super simple, super automated for everyone. Uh, there has been a lot of milestones that we have achieved over a very relatively short period of time, and we continue to grow very, very fast. We are now one of the leading personal finance apps in the, in the, in the App Store. We um, just recently won the Best Digital Advisory Solution Award by DigFin, uh, as well as um, just a month back, we announced our Series B funding round of 30 million US dollar. And this was by Valar Ventures, which is basically backed by Peter Thiel, who is the founder of PayPal. So again, very strategic uh, investors have backed what we are building. And again, they align to the goal that we have as well to bring more sophisticated, high quality investments uh, for everyone and make it super simple and super easy for everyone to get started with their investment journey. Uh, if you go on Slide uh, as part of this slice means is um, when you invest with us, uh, our own assets cannot be commingled with your assets. So, in a worst case scenario, not that it's going to happen, but if something happens to Saif. Um, all the investor assets, because they are kept separate uh, with our custodians, which is Citibank and HSBC, 
all of those have to be returned back to the clients in full, right? So, so this license basically ensures that safety for you. If we go on to the next slide, um, just quickly highlighting some of our portfolios. So we espouse to again, make investing easy and give you portfolios which are goal oriented, which have some purpose defined to them as well. And to that extent, we roughly bucket our portfolios into three segments, the saving segment, the income segment, and the segment on the saving segment, we have a cash plus solution. Um, the cash plus solution gives a projected return of 1.5%. It is used as an alternative to a savings bank account. Right now, the interest rates are really, really low there. Uh, it is not a savings account by itself, though. It invests into money market and short duration bond funds. Uh, so it is, um, it is an investment portfolio, but an investment portfolio with very, very low risk because of the high quality money market exposures that you're getting. On the income side, we have our REITs portfolio. This is one of the most popular portfolios on our platform, very unique to us. This is built in partnership with the Singapore Stock Exchange. The returns of uh, the REITs portfolio have been pretty good if you have invested in it from a longer duration standpoint. Uh, there are two options for you. One is a REITs with bonds portfolio. So it has a little bit lower risk compared to 100% REITs portfolio, which is uh, a little bit higher risk, but in terms of overall returns, it's higher as well. Plus. Also, the dividend yield of the 100% REIT portfolio uh, at 2021 estimated is 5.1% versus the other one at 4.2%. So a lot of younger investors use our REIT portfolios by reinvesting the dividends and using it as a growth portfolio. A lot of older investors use our REIT portfolio as a way to generate passive income through the dividends. If you come onto the more growth side of investments, we have our core range of portfolios. So these are portfolios which are actually globally diversified across asset classes, bond, gold, equity, all of those. So you have the range going from defensive balance to growth and equity 100. And as you can see, the risk level increases as you go from defensive all the way to equity 100. At the same time, uh, the return expectations also increase as you go from left to right as well. So uh, again, if you want to go into more details about these strategies, happy to share them uh, in a separate, I mean, we do have more sessions where we cover these plus um, I think we'll cover later on that we have uh, an advisory team. So you can reach out to us directly if you want to know these in more detail as well. If you go into the next section, very, very easy for you to get started. We are on the App Store and the Google Play Store. You can download the app. Uh, you can get started. You can see the portfolios, see the forecast, start investing, you know, get, get onboarded through Mindful. It literally takes a few minutes to onboard. And once you are there, essentially everything is shown transparently to you uh, for, for your investments. If you go on to the next slide, this basically covers how the fees change as you invest more onto our platform, the fee keeps coming down. So um, at blue, which is basically, there is no minimum to get started, but uh, as you invest say $20,000, your total management fee is 0.5%. If you invest 100,000, 0.4%. And as you invest more, the management fee keeps coming down. And by the way, this management fee actually covers everything. So if you see the next slide, uh, we don't charge you any brokerage fee, all trading fees, entry exit fees, whether there is a rebalance, all of those things are taken care of by us. There is no lock-in, there is no switching costs. So dividends are automatically reinvested or for the REITs portfolio, you can choose to get the dividends uh, credited, credited to your bank account on a quarterly basis. So all of these things are built in uh, in the portfolio and uh, essentially the only thing that you are sort of paying to us is the management fee. Right? Uh, if you compare our investments with a more DIY approach, what you'll observe is again, uh, you're sort of getting like a hands-free way to get invested. We are doing all the heavy lifting for you, whether it is to optimize your portfolio, whether it is to reinvest your dividends, whether it is to take care of transaction fees and all, you just need to choose your portfolio, get started, keep depositing on a regular basis. You don't have to worry about, you know, each time you invest, there is going to be an entry fee or exit fee, those kind of things. Uh, none of those apply and the fees are pretty low for the value that you're getting. And in terms of upcoming webinars, we have a deep dive session. Uh, there has been a lot of questions around uh, ETFs and mutual funds, the differences between them and how um, uh, you know, ETFs compare against mutual funds when you're constructing a global portfolio. So this, I think, is 
a, a must must uh, attend event in my opinion very very informative so please uh, do try to try to attend uh, will be very very interesting for everyone uh, last but not the least uh, if you go on to the next slide uh, we, as we shared earlier, um, we have a dedicated wealth expert team, Jashun, who's there with me right now, and myself, who heads the overall team. Um, we have a pretty strong team, so do go on to our website. There is a way to schedule calls with us. If you don't find slots, we host uh, weekly sessions where uh, anyone can just join in. It's like an open house and ask your questions uh, to us. And last but not the least, I think we are just above eight. So maybe a couple of questions before we wrap up. Jashwin? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think we've covered quite a fair bit of questions earlier on maybe. So um, I only have one very interesting question. <laughs> sure. Uh, okay. So um, this viewer is actually asking whether or not uh, Saif actually loan out clients' assets in order to generate additional interest you know, similar <laughs> to like how, you know, those zero fee ETFs, they use this to generate extra income. Right. So I, I think right now we are not doing any of such things because um, uh, as, as a responsible asset manager, we don't want to have these complexities built that if you have loaned collateral and all, this has actually led to downfall of a lot of players in the market previously where they had loaned collateral and stuff like that. And um, suddenly, if the player had some issues, um, it was tough to unwind those positions and get investors their money back and all. So we operate in a very, very plain vanilla way. Uh, our intent is to make sure that your money is kept safeguarded. That's the that's the most important thing that we consider rather than, you know, like we can generate extra interest and stuff like that on it. But um, uh, again, we would not do it at the cost of um, potentially having issues uh, in terms of uh, client monies. Uh, being stuck somewhere yeah yeah thanks for the clarification i think that helps so um i think with that we have come to the end of uh, today's session and i really hope that you know this was an insightful session for all our viewers so uh, with that um thank you so much Ritesh, you know for the sharing and um the rest of our viewers for joining us this evening um and have a restful evening everyone thanks everyone have a good evening thank you bye bye, -bye.